right, everyone, we are back with the How I Sell podcast. Today, we have a very special guest. Uh, It's Mr. Matt Clark. Matt (laughs) has had a great career and a career that's very interesting to me and hopefully for our audience as well. So he started in politics and he's ended in BD and he's had some great stops along the way, like Microsoft and Amazon and now Masterclass. Matt, welcome to the show. Danny, great to be here. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, before we jump into our five questions, as a reminder for our audience, (laughs) season two, same five questions of all of our guests to give everybody an apples to apples comparison. Uh, Matt, we want to ask you, who is Matt Clark? Oh, gosh, who is Matt Clark? Well, I guess he's a proud father and husband, but uh, he's someone who really likes learning things, uh, likes to be doing things that he feels are meaningful. And I love the sort of process of working with other people and solving problems and trying to do things. You know, I'll I'll talk to my old teams about, you know, creating stories in your career that you can sort of dine out on. So I I just like the challenge of things and, and uh, working things out and, and trying as many new things as I can. I love that. Uh, Someone who experiments and then, uh, you know, I've I've never heard that before, but stories you can dine out on. That's uh, that's a great place to be. That's a great place to be. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, like in any career, you know, even if you want to be very, uh, you know, manual about it, like if you're in a job interview, what are you doing but telling stories of things you've achieved and how you achieve them? And, you know, as I think back on my career, the way I've been able to go between different roles It's because I can talk about the skills that I used and what I was able to solve and how that could apply somewhere new. And so the idea of thinking about stories is in a way to both train yourself to think about how your skills transfer, but also it's just fun. You know, life is about having good moments and good stories. So I think that's a good way to think about it. Love it. Love it. Uh, Something that we preach here at Ramp 2, especially during the course, is how to tell stories about yourself instead of just listing those bullet points. I'm sure we'll hit on this uh, throughout the conversation. But if you're ready, uh, I'm ready to jump into the questions. The questions. Let's go. All right. So question number one, what is the best investment someone early in their career can do for themselves and why? Well, let me sort of put it in context. As someone who's in business development and and lately at least you might say sort of strategic business development, you know, a lot of having to do with devices and media, um, I'll I'll sort of answer from that perspective. And I think one of the best things anyone could do is maybe go take a graduate philosophy class. I did an entire year on platonic philosophy. And what did it teach me at the time was just a way to think about things, a different perspective, how to argue, how to reframe. And if you think about strategic business development, there's lots of paths to it, but the the common attribute in anyone who's doing it is their ability to problem solve and think differently. And so, you know, the best early investment is is just go challenge yourself to think uh, critically and become a, you know, a very critical thinker and observer of the world, I think is probably the best investment someone could make. That's, um, that's interesting that you say that. Actually, the first time we've heard it, I think on either season, that somebody has said, and I, I really do love this perspective, uh, you know, go take a class on something, go uh, learn something new about the world and how it operates. Uh, generally, we hear, you know, go out, just just go out and do it. Just go out and <laughs> do it. You know, when, uh, when, when do you think is the right time to learn and how do you know that the the classes that you're taking or the the stuff you're learning about are, are going to inform your career well so, uh, what first thing i would agree with the idea of going out and doing things um but one thing you might say is you know if you look at business schools there's you know specialties in marketing or specialties in finance you never hear of a specialty in business development and i think that's because business development at the end of the day is, is the culmination of people's experience applied to sort of complex business problems and so uh, i think there's this sort of hybrid i you know i'm partially joking about this idea of taking a philosophy course but probably not that much uh but what i would say that all right blend in this i just doing it is if you're going to go do it do it from a critical lens you're better off in my opinion if you want to be in business development working in the first introductory roles in marketing and learning it and going deep on marketing and then go you know try to build your skills in finance i you know i did all the certification to be a stockbroker never became one of course 
but that helped me understand the ins and outs of you know bonds and equity and so forth. And then you might apply yourself somewhere else. I you know, again, I had started out in public policy. If you get that culmination of experience where you're applying yourself and thinking critically, it's going to lead you someplace good regardless. In my case, it happened to be business development. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Uh, I think a lot of threads there, um, and we've heard we've heard some of it before. But I think the perspective is, you know, sometimes it's just that that piece of learning that can give you a more well-rounded perspective to kind of crescendo into what you actually want to be doing or what you find that you want to be doing, especially in BD, because it can be, you know, so unique and so broad. Listen, I, I, yeah, you, you'd mentioned uh, many of your listeners are sort of early career. Uh, in early in my career, I had a degree in Canadian public policy. Like that's not generally seen as a straight line to business development at Amazon or Masterclass. But that's probably, you know, the, hopefully the people can have in their minds is there's no straight line. But what is true is this ability to immerse yourself, apply to yourself, and, and then think and move critically. Um, if you do that or you can build that skill set, It'll take you to where you want to be. The idea that anyone knows that when they're 20 years old that I'm going to be an investment banker and think that's the rest of their life, I'd say, great if that happens to work out for you. But I think it's unreasonable for most people to know exactly what they're going to do in their early 20s and feel like they're going to stay in that role, You know, whether it's sales, finance, what have you, for 20, 40 years. <laughs> hard to imagine. Yeah, if you, uh, if you ask me my junior year, uh, early in my junior year, I you know, graduated from uh, the Roscoe business at Michigan. What I wanted to do, I would tell you investment banking. And then late in my junior year, uh, the market collapsed and I uh, would tell you something totally different coming into senior year. Well, it's just, it's experience is one of the great things. Like, that's the other part. Like some people say, well, why would you go into that? It's going to be a waste of your time. And I'm like, how is it a waste of your time to figure out that it's not something you want to do? If you think time is a career that's going to span 30, 40 years, a year or two deciding that you don't like marketing or you don't like what have you is probably well time well spent because you'll learn yep. enough about marketing to apply it later, but know enough about marketing to say it's not for me. Yep. That's awesome. Um, moving on to question number two, what is the biggest surprise you experienced early in your career? I think one of the things that struck me early in my career was just how the tendency of all professionals or many professionals is to revert to the norm or the the known or the most palatable path or the the most protective path and i think that's unfortunate like i was struck how many times people like well that's sort of too risky or mm, i don't know that's not how we normally do it here and I, you know, I'd say that's both an opportunity and a challenge for someone who wants to go get into, let's say, business development. The opportunity is, um, you know, one way to think about it is people revert to the norm because they have this way of looking at things. And your ability to change and reframe the perspective is often the path to the solution. And so this great opportunity to sort of provide a new perspective, give a new solution and go do something really exciting and challenging and new. The challenge, of course, is, you know, it, it's going to be more work. If you're going to convince someone to do something new or to re, you know, rethink about the problem, you're going to have to invest enormous amounts of effort and time and your own intellect and research to help them get there. And sometimes you won't at all. And so, you know, it can feel disheartening sometimes to be in a work environment and especially early career and just realize how conservative people want to be. Uh, but, you know, don't let it get you down. I think, you know, there is an opportunity there if you're willing to put the work in. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's great advice. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious to know, because I think you had such a unique early into, you know, where you are now, early part of your career as a, you know, getting into politics like how did you step out and be like that's the switch that i want to make like how what was that decision like and you know walk us through kind of some of the well, the things you were considering well it's, it just to be clear like my training was canadian public policy uh i worked for a you know a lobby group when i started as a research analyst and then i worked at the canadian embassy in uh washington dc uh doing sort of essentially commercial advice to companies who are working with things like the World Bank and the IMF. Um, and what what I would say there is my training in public policy is, is to see things that are gray, 
public policy is not cut and dried. It's not a one or a zero. It's very gray area. So it's very much understanding the, the sort of balance between certain objectives. From there, it's just curiosity moves you along, right? And so again, that that's that common uh, ramp there um, that allows you to move from you know public policy in Canada to international commercial procurement to technology. It's just the ability to see the gray areas to reframe and, and frankly, to do the work. You, you have to be interested in curious person. Otherwise, you're going to get you're going to get pretty uh, stale. Yep. That's awesome. And another thread we've heard uh, across many guests was that that curiosity. It has to be genuine. You know, with something we teach in our program, too, is like how to create genuine curiosity. But like, really, you, you got to have it or you don't. Right. Well, and I, you know, you can look at it this way. You either inherently need curiosity or let's say you're you're sort of a more <laughs> one, two, three type of person. Curiosity is your data gather, gathering stage. Like one way to look at it, if you want to be more engineering mindset is curiosity equals data gathering. And if you are not a biased data gathering machine, you're going to come to it with an open mind and you're going to listen to it and internalize it and look at it from different angles. And right when you think you have the conclusion, you're going to resist your desire to have a conclusion and ask more questions to gather more data. And so whether you are inherently curious or you may think, or maybe I'm not, but I'm very methodical, you need to be gathering data in order to find a new way to reframe things and come up with creative opportunities. And so um, I think that's important. And the other thing I'll tell you about curiosity is uh, in a work environment, and I'm sure it would be true for early salespeople or people who want to get into BD, is you your curiosity is also curiosity about the person across from you not what they had for dinner or blah, 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 but the curiosity of understanding the emotional uh, attributes that they're bringing to the problem. So, you know, if someone, when you advise or you're trying to sell someone, part of it is, yeah, my SaaS service is so fantastic, but understanding the sort of emotional baggage, let's say the person's bringing to the table. And I don't mean that in a negative sense, like, is this helping them get to the next job? Is this something that if they don't do their boss, like, those things matter and how make people make decisions. So being curiosity and learning about those motivations in a natural way from the people you're selling to or working with, I think will help in, in the, you know, be more successful. Yep. I love it. Very, very well said. And for our audience, Matt just dropped a bunch of knowledge on us that uh, is something that I, <laughs> I, I found I found has been helpful for me in my career and uh, not something I knew coming out of school. You don't you don't ever get taught you know, in business school or in school, like, you know, how, how to be curious or what curiosity actually means or why it's important. So uh, take this one to heart. Well, one of the, just on that note is one of the best pieces of advice I ever got when I left the embassy and started my own consulting business, someone said, if you want to be a good consultant, you need to read a book called The Trusted Advisor by David Meister. And I won't bore people with it, but it, it, it is sort of a business book about how to be curious, how to be aware of people's sort of emotional state and how to reframe problems. So I highly recommend it. It's not just for consultants, it's for anyone who wants to work with people, persuade people and get into a position of trust with people they, they work for. Awesome, awesome, love it. Uh, moving on to question number three. What is one mistake you made early in your career that shaped the way you operate today? I, I guess you could look at the question two ways, like mistakes you made. Oh, I took a job this or that. I, I don't feel I've made mistakes from that perspective. I've followed my curiosity and I've learned and I've taken risks that I thought were the right risk. An actual mistake I've made <laughs> was early when I was working for the sort of the, the lobby group, the business lobby group in Canada, where we were doing some work with a lot of sort of you know, hoity-toity sort of eminent grise, sort of smart people who had been in politics and were looking at an issue. And one of the members had actually run this agency. And in this discussion with all his colleagues, he basically completely crapped on the agency and said it was useless. And I took notes and I circulated notes to the people and he lost it. He was oh, so upset. <laughs> because he was like, if anyone reads those notes, uh, I, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it was a mistake. I didn't use good judgment 
in putting the notes and it reminded me notes have consequences. But I also say this, it was also a very learning element for me because I thought to myself, wait a second, you ran that agency. If there was any person who could have turned it into something more useful, it could, it was you and yet you didn't. And I thought, what a shame that is, right? So it was both a learning for me is don't F up, like do get, you know, be smart, use your judgment better. But it was also learning from like, don't ever, like I never want to leave this world with some searing regret yeah. about yeah. what I should have done in a different role. Yep. Well, uh, thanks for sharing that. I know it's always easy to share your mistakes, but I think what, what's what's tied this crew, at least the folks that have come on the podcast and myself included, obviously, is, um, you know, when, when you're in the moment with the mistake, uh, it, it's it's hard to realize it. But the perspective when you come out of it is it's it's something you learn from. It's a blip on the radar. And and hopefully it's something that uh, helps shape where you go in your career going forward. Well, I'll say at the time that uh, my boss, um, a guy named Thomas DeQuino, uh, had given me good advice. He basically said, acknowledge your mistake, apologize for your mistake, and, and again, acknowledge what it meant to that person. So I had to not just only apologize, but say, you know, I understand that would, that puts you in a horrible position. And he calmed down, and I think it was a good lesson. It's like, own up, it's not the end of the world. Uh, recognize the emotional sort of <laughs> charge that came with it, and then learn. And so I got good advice at the time. Love it. Love it. And thanks for passing that on too. Question number four, who has had the greatest impact on your career? And for context, your our guests take this sometime in a situation if they're uncomfortable naming a name, or you could do both. Totally fine. Well, I mentioned the book, The Trusted Advisor. If you, you know, that book really shaped how I thought about how I wanted to work, how I wanted to be a manager how I want to interact with people. So, so I, I'll start with that. But actual people, um, there's a fellow named Frank McCosker who hired me at Microsoft, uh, basically <laughs> off the internet. He found my consulting business and we, we, you know, I tried out. And I'll just say this about Frank. Frank is a close friend of mine now, but Frank was the first manager I had who I would say sort of managed living by his values. He wanted his team to be empowered. He wanted them to take risks. He wanted his team to have fun. And he managed along those values. And it was very instructional for me, this whole idea that it wasn't this sort of methodical management style, but like a leadership style. And so uh, I learned a great deal from Frank and it, you know, he's, as I said, he's a close friend of mine now. And, and, and he, what I think was very influential, thinking about how when I had teams to manage, how I'd want to manage them. And I hope I've lived up to it, but who knows? You have to ask my team. But Frank, uh, he, was, he, he just illustrated so much to me about someone with integrity and someone who cared about his team and had a, a view of how he would lead his team um, that I, you know, I really left a mark for me. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Well, one, we'll drop the book for sure in the show notes and make sure everybody uh, has access to that. And I'm glad it's been so influential. And two, you know, it's nice to wind up with someone uh, like Frank in your career. I think that's um, not always the case for folks, especially, uh, you know, early in their career. How do you determine if you're going to wind up with someone like Frank or somebody who potentially could uh, harpoon the early part of your career with, <laughs> <laughs> with, with, well, uh, you, yeah, it's with a great manager. Question. So, yeah, you, you can't always know, uh, I, and especially early career individuals, you, you, you know, let's be frank, the power dynamic is off, uh, or for an early career, but what I, I'd say a couple things. One, if you're early career, when you're interviewing, treat it as an interview of both directions. Right. And I would encourage, uh, people to ask questions of the manager about their management style and things they value. Um, those are important questions. And if the manager can't answer it, that should be a flashing red light. I'll also say this, there's no job that I'm aware of that is worth the mental and physical anguish of a, a mean-spirited or abusive manager. And I'm pleased we're in a day and age where there's more, uh, uh, let's say, mechanisms within companies to address those things. They're not always fantastic mechanisms, but they exist. But like, don't, I don't, I'd hate to hear about, you know, ramped listeners who are like, I'm just going to grind this out. Like, I get it. 
there's times where you got to sort of work hard and suck it up, but never when it comes to an abusive manager over time. That's not something you should tolerate. Raise your hand appropriately through the mechanisms of your company or find another gig. Trust me, they're out there um, and you'll learn more <laughs> and be happier in a different gig than one with abusive manager. So there's no, no rhyme or reason. Ask questions, but don't settle. Uh, do not settle for that type of relationship. Yep, yep. I uh, I love that advice, and uh, it's it's easy in the moment to kind of get sucked in and think this is the only option for you. Uh, and if you quit, you will look this way in a certain light towards other folks. But again, I think it goes back to your, your original part, which is just how do you tell the story? How how are you yeah. positioning it? Listen, managers, I hate to say it, like any people, they're going to gaslight you sometimes. If you look at some of the stories about, you know, let's say that, what is it, uh, you know, Weinstein and others that have been abusive, they'll, they'll try to convince you you're the problem. And, you know, uh, there may be times you're just a poor performer, but it doesn't mean abuse is, is uh, acceptable. It's, it's kind of like uh, dating. I'd say the best advice I've ever got is someone you, you should be with is someone who brings out the best in you, not the worst in you. And so if you're in a working relationship and, and you've lost your confidence and you think you're stupid and you think you're not like, that's, a, that's not a good relationship. Uh, they should be bringing up the best in you and, and helping you and helping you improve the areas that need work. But if they're abusive, like that's don't tolerate it, say something or, or if you're not comfortable doing that, find a new gig. There'll be plenty of other good managers out there. hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, last question, we've asked our guests on both seasons of how I sell this question at the end. Uh, if you could go back in time, now that you have the benefit of hindsight, what advice would you give yourself as you were entering into your career? Yeah, you know, it maybe ties to the discussion we just had is seniority doesn't equal maturity. <laughs> just because someone is high up in an organization does not mean they're a mature adult. It does not mean they're a capable manager. It, it does not mean they're someone who's got your best interests in heart. And that's a difficult realization. It's, you know, it's kind of like when you're a teenager, you realize that adults aren't perfect. It, when you become an early career person, you realize that managers are just as flawed. I don't know what to say other than that, that I think I would have saved myself a bit of angst early in my career and throughout my career if I sort of internalized that better and let's put it this way had less hope for what would turn into a better relationship or a better manager um, unfortunately some people just aren't going to grow that way um, and that I think means again if I were an early career professional I just have to be conscious of that and treat it as some of the one of the main characteristics in assessing whether this job or this role is right for me is whether the people around me particularly the managers are you know good well-meaning people who give you latitude to go try things and and coach you when you need coaching uh, and do so respectfully. Um, and if they don't exist, as I said, find a new gig or say something. Um, I, I think that would be the biggest thing I would, would have told myself when I head out into the career world at the time. Yeah, it's awesome and sage advice. And uh, I, I appreciate you sharing that, you know, although although I do hope that uh, my young son uh, thinks of me <laughs> as the 100% uh, the right version of until, until far beyond his teenage years. So I'm just, I'm just joking, but, uh, but, but I, no, I do no. think. <laughs> I think you want him to think you're 100% always in his side, but at yeah. times you may come short because unless you're you're a superhero which doesn't exist there's going to be times that's true and their, their ability to sort of acknowledge and accept it is probably the key thing awesome uh, and i think the thread there you know it's been pretty consistent throughout is throughout this conversation is just be around good people who have your back who are supportive who want the best for you and then challenge you and give you the right advice when you need it right and and do the same for others awesome awesome i love that uh, well, Matt, we really, really appreciate you being on the show. Uh, where can folks find you? Where can they find me? Well, I guess, you, you know, I like to hang out at the local restaurant from time to time called The Table in Willow Glen. But uh, I think the simplest way is on LinkedIn. 
Um, I'm prone to offer, you know, some general advice and mentorship if, if people ask politely to do their research. Uh, I am not prone for unsolicited sales calls through LinkedIn sales professionals at early career. Please do not do it. You will not endear yourself to me, but, uh, but I'm happy to, you know, do my best to give advice from time to time. Awesome. Well, uh, hopefully we won't have a flood of folks who, uh, who just hit you up with no contact. So I think that, you know, do, do your homework, do <laughs> your homework and nice. Matt will be there for do you. The <laughs> yeah. Read the book first, the trusted advisor, then give me a, give me a shout. That's a, that's an easy one. So uh, it's a one, two punch book, book, then shout. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's right. Well, Matt, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. This has been so insightful and our folks are going to love it and love learning from you. Uh, so thanks so much again. And we hope to have you back someday soon on how I sell. Thanks, Dan. I enjoyed it. I hope people enjoyed it as well. All right. See you soon. Bye-bye.